Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Marketing Monday. Here on a Tuesday, we have one story today, and I just want to go into it from a couple angles because we've been talking about a lot of heavy subjects on Marketing Monday recently, and they've been getting a little bit too serious. With this being the stock market today, I wanted to just leave you guys with one actual win. As of 12.01 a.m. tonight, after 146 days, the writer strike that has shut down all of Hollywood has come to an end. The studios have reached a deal with the Writers Guild of America to end the strike. And you may see an important thing in the line here. They've gotten most of what they wanted. It's actually a pretty phenomenal deal. I'm gonna go down into it, but at a high level, I want you to know that like, if you're looking at a short term, like who made out from this deal? The writers. The writers got a lot of what they asked for and a lot more than the studios were willing to offer just a few months ago. Hundreds of millions of dollars lost for companies like Warner Brothers. They eventually had to, had to cave. They had to make a deal and so they did. Now let's go into it on uh, uh, specifics. So first off, huge protections against AI. AI cannot write or rewrite written material. Um, they cannot credit AI generated material as material. A writer can choose to use AI, but the studio can't force the writer to use AI. Heads of shows called showrunners have to be qualified as writers, which means there's a lot of knock-on effects to this, but it means when they hire writers, they count as one of the writers. They can't use a like a studio executive to be the, sh the quote showrunner and then cut out all the writers. All of it has to fall under the same rules that they're a part of the deal. Um, and then ton of other things, success-based residuals, uh, minimum writer's room staffing, guaranteed compensation, 13-week minimums. Shows like comedy and variety are counted under the the same rules as other shows where they were set as separately before two-step deals for screen a lot of things all right and, and again this may not if you're not a writer some of this doesn't even make sense to you the point is like there are things that were problems in their job things that like made it hard to pursue writing as a career and studios were not going to give these things unless <laughs> something happened they were not going to give it if you just asked them nicely and so by shutting down and showing the value of their work writers are able to get these things now it's not all sunshine and rainbows but i'll get to that in a second now one of the major things and again i want to show you how big of a win this was this is a chart that shows on the left what the Writers Guild originally proposed. In the middle, the studios originally responded with, and on the right is what they actually got in green. Now, I'm not gonna go through all these, but you'll notice that like, I, mean, I looked at this whole document, everything in the center column was originally rejected. <laughs> I'm only showing you one slide, but it used to be every single thing in this column was like rejected, 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 rejected. But after it turns out a few months of realizing they're not gonna make any money off movies, they changed their tune. By literally waiting more time, they got a lot of what they asked for. For example, uh, this is foreign streaming residuals. This is like getting paid when your show is streamed in a different country. Um, they asked for 50% of foreign payment as a residual base for under 20 million subs, 47%, just as an example. The studios offered like 8%, 8%, 1635 for different sub counts. And that was their original counter offer. And they said, no, the writer said no. And they got this. You know, this had an effect and this is real and this is cool. They're also getting paid uh, based on viewership. Again, for the longest time, if you were a writer and you wrote a hit show for Netflix, you don't make any more money if that show's a hit or if it's not. You just get one flat fee. Now you get a bonus. They're actually revealing their viewership stats secretly to the writers and you get a bonus if it hits a certain number of people watching it. That's cool. It's incredible to say, but like for any worker everywhere, it's good to look at this and see like, hey, they would not have gotten any of this otherwise. This actually worked and it got them, it got them concession they wouldn't have gotten, which is cool. It was, again, it went from rejected to bam, all of these bonuses if, you're, if your show gets viewed by over 20%. Read this. This is from uh, May. May 1st, the studio says, rejected our proposal, refused to make a counter. <laughs> and now, only four months later, they're giving tens of thousands of dollars if your show gets 20% or more. That's cool. What are the downsides? I, I, again, I'm, I'm trying to keep this concise and, and give you guys an update so you can share this with your friends. What are the downsides? Number one is, now that the writers are back to work, they're gonna actually write things. <laughs> and not all of them are cool. <laughs> Like for example, a reboot of The Office is going to be announced once the strike is lifted. Oh God, oh God. We're gonna have another generation of people whose office, who, who The Office is their entire personality, which is, <laughs> you know, that's one downside. And the second is these studio heads, uh, this is the part I wanna get into. Cause all I've seen on Twitter, all I've seen is positivity. And I don't wanna be a negative Nancy, but I also wanna say that these studio heads, they're snakes, bro. And they're smarter, <laughs> I mean, they're dumb in a lot of ways, but they're, they're wily. And and I think there's a little bit more to this contract when I read it through that is not being discussed. And I think they've, they have a plan. I, again, at the end of the day, the writers made a huge game, but there is a plan here and I wanna talk about it. What do you think on this page is my concern? If you had to guess, some of you noticed it. This popped out to me immediately. And I actually think I need a vine boom for this. 
<laughs> the term of the agreement, this is an amazing record setting agreement for writers, but it has an end date. May 1st, 2026, all of these gains are up for review. They are only locked in to these studios three years. Now that combines with one other thing, one small thing that the studios fought for and got a concession on. And that's this, the studios will be able to use film and TV scripts they already own to refine AI tools and experiment. So if you combine these two things, I see a plan, I see a plan. And the plan is for these fucks, to take all of the scripts they already have and train AI tools, which will get better over three years to be able to write and create stuff and reduce the bargaining power of writers. And then reemerge three years later with a better negotiating position. That is what I see and that is what scares me. Now, I do not want to detract from the amazing work that the WGA has done. They have, they have won unprecedented gains for writers. It's awesome. The ability to get paid residuals from streaming services is huge. And I do think it is very hard to claw those back once writers have gotten them. I just want to say that there's clearly in my mind a plan here. And the plan is, okay, we lost. We got caught blindsided by a double strike. We don't know what we're doing. We've been shut down. We're losing money. Let's call, let's punt. Let's give them everything they want, but for a time limit, get ready to fight again. And that's what I think they're doing. I think they're getting ready for 2026 to come back hard. I think they're going to have shows stockpiled up. They're going to have better AI technology. And they're going to try and really grind some of these concessions back from the writers. And I hope the writers are aware of this and I hope they take it seriously and don't get complacent in the next couple years because I don't think this fight is over. The actors are still on strike and there's a lot more actors than there are writers. There's like 170,000 working actors who are all part of SAG-AFTRA who are trying to get, again, their own version of a fair deal. Now, for a while, the studio's plan, Bob Iger's plan, the original strategy was to only talk with the writers and get a deal there first. It's an easier one. And then again, once one of the, the groups stops striking, the other one is under more pressure because everyone else wants, the writers want to get back to work, you know, and then the actors are kind of holding it back. And there's, when it's solidarity, it's easier. When it's one, it's harder. So they are trying to put pressure on the actors, which is more of them and get a better deal. We'll see how it goes. That being said, they haven't spoken for two months. The actors in the studios have had no conversations for two months, but after this deal is signed, there's progress. They're going to meet within a few days. And hopefully, I think there's a lot of momentum on both sides to be done with this. They want to get back to work. Everyone wants to work again. And hopefully based on the concessions earned by the writers, the actors can get something similar. They can all get a pretty solid deal and we can get, you know, our slop for 2024. <laughs> Everyone here wants their, you know, Marvel movie slop. They want Dune 2. They want, you know, uh, whatever. They want Rick and Morty. They want Emily in Paris. They want their slop, okay? And and this could happen without uh, sacrificing the power of the workers uh, within a few days if negotiations go well. And again, I, I, this, I like this from a writer. It ain't over until sag gets the deal they deserve. See y'all on the picket line this week. Some people are part writers and actors. They're going to be picketing for both. It's awesome. I, again, I'm fully respective of the, the Actors Guild. They've continued to expand their strike against video game companies. Again, a lot of actors that work in voice acting for video games are chronically underpaid. Uh, there's an expansion going there. What you have to understand is like, this stuff has knock-on effects in all other movements. Again, SAG-AFTRA has a successful strike against video game companies. It enables uh, programmers who work for EA and other video game companies to strike. Better rights, because they're underpaid too. There's people at Epic who have been working crunch nonstop for five years making Fortnite skins that probably deserve paid time off <laughs> and that they're not getting. And and it, you know this, this this it all snowballs so I, again i think i think this is um is all positive effect and i hope they have success but that being said there is no news after they meet in the next few days we're gonna have more of a story but until then it's up in the air what happens with the actors there is one unique quirk to close out this segment on hollywood that i thought was interesting came from the writers and actors strike because if you guys know when the actors and writers are on strike nobody can really go promote films and movies there's like no way to do red carpets there's no way to do interviews there's no way to do podcasts there's no way to do all the actors that usually promote films can't do it. And so studios have been trying to get creative and look at the world and see how they can promote film and TV in the absence of stars. And they looked over to TikTok. <laughs> and if you'll notice on TikTok, studios have not been cracking down on the proliferation of three minute clip channels that basically have entire seasons of old shows. Now this was not their idea, but they've noticed it. I don't know, if you spend any time on TikTok, you'll notice you're constantly getting fed like teen of a show you've never seen. And some Sometimes when you watch that part, you get hooked. <laughs> 
<laughs> you get hooked and all of a sudden you're watching the whole season. All of a sudden you're a fan of the show you didn't even know about or forgot about. Perhaps you're even watching House on a streamer's channel. <laughs> and all of a sudden you didn't even grow up with House, but you're a big House fan now. Perhaps, perhaps this freebooted content on social media is actually having, rather than the, they expect negative effects, it's having positive effects. It's causing people who, are, who didn't grow up with any of this shit to become fans of these shows and then spend money on merch or, or you know, um, buying subscriptions or, or whatever or for, for the show. I like the idea of this tweet where he says, whoever bought the, brought the idea of posting movie shows on TikTok in 10,000 parts needs a raise. As if it was a TikTok guy's idea. <laughs> As if it just wasn't one person just like fucking uploading a show they like. They thought it was like a planned idea. That's so stupid. It, but yeah, it is. You know what it reminds me of? It's like the, uh, it's like Quibi should have been. <laughs> if you guys remember, there was a failed 2 billion startup called Quibi where they wanted to make quick bites, short shows for social media. What they should have done is just take existing old cheap shows and chop them up. And it would have been a slam dunk because it turns out the 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 idea of watching something on your phone in a short little chunk is um, extremely good from a marketing POV in ways you wouldn't expect. First of all, chunk it up into under three minute um, chunks. It doesn't get flagged as easily under copyright laws because of fair use. Under three minute chunk has a chance to be fair use. And then also um, because the individual clips have different individual levels of virality, like one part of the movie can go viral. And so the best part parts of the movie are automatically like algorithmically discovered and then served to people and they watch that one clip they like it and they go back and watch the rest like it's actually a pretty clever way to optimize the retention of the movie to find the best parts they're better than real trailers uh, all of this has become you know uh, a shock to hollywood and instead of shutting it down they've been cautiously optimistic they've been looking into it and some are jumping in full force so i found out that netflix not only doesn't shut the shit down but they just posted the latest episode Episode of their show Top Boy entirely on their main channel. This is the main Netflix account. They're doing it themselves. <laughs> Put like, and you can notice, like, I mean, look at the example right here. What the fuck happened in part 12? Why does that have 25 million views? Everything else doesn't. I don't know. But now they know that part's interesting. They use that part in ads and whatever. So uh this whole thing, you know, from a marketer's POV, while not directly related to the strikes, was caused by the strikes for them not cracking down on it, and it's been very interesting. While I don't know if after the strikes are over, they're gonna take a more critical look at it and shut it down. I do think the fact that people are getting back into shows they've already watched because of clips on TikTok, a change in media habits and not a one-term thing, not a one-time thing. And I do think people are gonna lean into it more going forward. So if you are a brain rotted Zoomer who likes watching shit in three minute chunks on TikTok, I think the future for you is very bright. <laughs> and that ladies and gentlemen is the end of my update on the writer strike and this single topic marketing Monday. Thank you for watching. Check it. Check it.